Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you to our second lecture and discussion uh, for Kate Rayworth's course on the fundamentals of donut economics. Uh, this has been an extraordinary experience. Uh, when we met last time, we had uh, just about 300 people signed up. And as we meet today, uh, we're pushing 350 uh, people from uh, over 45 countries all over the world. Uh, this is the largest course that we've had uh, ever at Ubiquity University. And we're absolutely thrilled uh, that all of you uh, have joined uh, from so many countries around the world to explore uh, one of the seminal ideas. And that is how humanity uh, at this critical moment of uh, ecological and I would say uh, social duress, we can embrace a very simple new story and model for how we shape our basic economic interactions uh, amongst ourselves and between humanity and the larger uh, ecosystem. Uh, Kate's course uh, is the launching of a whole new master's in business administration uh, that uh, we've uh, convened over the last uh, year or so, uh, beginning uh, with an initiative of uh, Ed Muller, uh, the president of the University of International Cooperation, and Joel Carboni at uh, Green Project Management, uh, and uh, over 40 other uh, uh, groups around the world uh, to reinvent the MBA uh, and uh, really focus a master's program in regenerative action, uh, because that's what the world uh, critically needs at this moment. And uh, Kate Rayworth has written, uh, I think, the seminal work on, um, on economics uh, for our generation and for the future uh, with the imperative to uh, re-understand economics uh, within the context of the larger planetary ecosystem. So welcome, everyone. Uh, this is a four-week course. So this is the second of four weeks. We meet this time uh, every Wednesday. Uh, it's part of the new Masters in Regenerative Action, so we encourage those of you who are taking the course uh, to consider enrolling in the uh, entire uh, MRA program uh, because we want to uh, develop cohorts, uh, groups all over the world uh, that are learning about uh, regenerative uh, activities because at the heart of the uh, MRA program are impact projects in different biodiversity regions, different cities around the world, um, and the encompassing um, uh, image that unites us all uh, is the donut. So with that introduction, I turn it now over to uh, Kate Rayworth and her uh, colleague, uh, Andrew Fanning. Kate, welcome. Thank you, Jim. Thanks so much. It's great to be back here. We do um, this time with my colleague, Andrew Fanning, who I'm so glad is joining me from Donut Economics Action Lab. So we are going to be tag teaming and I'm going to share my screen. Welcome back, everybody. It's great to be here again. So here we go. This week, we are going to be downscaling the donut which is actually something that we at Donut Economics Action Lab spend a lot of our time doing because it's something that lots of people are keen to do to bring it to place, to make it relevant to where they are. So let's just recap. The Donut invites us to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. And when we look at it at the global scale, we see that millions, indeed billions of people in the world are falling short on the essentials of life, and yet we are collectively already overshooting multiple planetary boundaries. So this is the global donut. And I often say this is humanity's selfie of us and the living world at this moment. This is the story that we have to turn around. Ever since this was first published or a version like it was first published in 2012, people have wanted to say, okay, but what does it look like where we are? What is it like for our nation, for our country? Indeed, I remember somebody sending me this on Twitter. We're having a workshop in, in Berlin. We're trying to imagine the city donut for here, but also nations, communities, schools, at every level, people said, what would it mean to downscale this? And so it became very clear that there was a drive and a desire to have that visual and have that information. 
People have tried to do it in many, many different ways. And today what we want to do is share two ways that we think of quite contrasting ways that are both powerful and effective and both available in terms of how we think the donut can be downscaled to help drive action, because that's what it's all about. So what Andrew and I are going to do today is start with Andrew sharing about international downscaling across countries. The work that he did actually before he joined Donut Economics Action Lab, he was a researcher at Leeds University and working with a fantastic team there, including Dan O'Neill, Julia Steinberger and Will Lamb. They created these downscaled national donuts. That's how I first met Andrew, seeing these incredible national donuts popping up. So he's going to talk about that work and the power of it, challenges, what, what, what works and, and, and where the limits of doing that international downscaling. Then I'll come back in and talk about the work we've been doing over the last year and a half downscaling starting in global north cities because we began there so I'm starting from that perspective and then Andrew will come in and talk about how we're currently adapting this bottom-up portrait making process with places and for the needs and context of the global south. We will then break into discussion groups to in invite you to discuss with each other what you've heard, how you could see this could be useful and any suggestions and questions that you have back to us. And of course, there'll be chances for discussion all the way through this. And then I'll end with something that we call exploring the powers to act. We realize that if cities want to transform themselves, they need to transform often their own design and call on all the powers they have to act. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand to my colleague, Andrew Fanning, to take us into the story of downscaling the donut internationally. Thank you very much and hello everybody. It's a pleasure to be a, a part, a small part of this four week course. Uh, thanks for listening. As Kate mentioned, I'm data analysis and research lead at Donut Economics Action Lab and I will be walking through, well, just as Kate mentioned, we'll begin with the national down downscaling work that I was a part of at the University of Leeds. And let me just jump right in by sharing my screen and just showing a range of these national donuts that we've seen before. Uh, you can see, let me just start with Malawi. We're now familiar with the, with the global donut. These are now at the national scale. In Malawi, we can see there's a lot of red in the center of that donut. People living in Malawi are falling far short of the essentials of life. But at the same time, they're not overshooting any of the ecological indicators that we measured in this study. And this is with a, economic, a level of economic activity per person per year that's equivalent of only $1,000. Then we have China, partly in overshoot, partly falling short, similar to what we see at the global level, where that needing to come back within planetary boundaries while still meeting the needs of their residents for the very first time. And then the nation that I was born in, Canada, you can see is doing relatively well, at least based on this international standard in terms of social performance, which we'll come back to in a moment. But most dramatically, I mean, you can see Canada just massively overshooting its level of pressure on the planet. And we can take a step back. The study that we, that we looked at was actually for 150 nations. So here we can look at a whole spread of nations. And what you can see, here's Malawi, here's China, here's Canada. And there's the donut up in the top left corner where we're meeting the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. And what this, these results show is that there's no nation that can put up its hand and say, you know, we are living within the donut, regardless of where they are. That's why we at Deal, we no longer use the term developed or developing countries. Uh, we, we don't believe that that dichotomy is useful because from the perspective of the donut, all nations can be seen as developing nations. So we can think of low-income nations like Malawi and others. What kind of journey would it mean to for these nations who are treading lightly in terms of ecological pressure but falling far short of the social foundation. What would that journey mean to move towards the donut? Similarly, we can look, think of emerging economies like China or middle income nations. Same thing, what kind of policies or business models or theories will bring them back within planetary boundaries but meeting the needs of their residents for the very first time? And finally, of course, the high income nations where, where I was born, 
and many others who would like to tell the rest of the world that they are developed. I think that there's a quite a need of, for some ambition as well as a decent dose of humility because these nations too need to dramatically change course. I mean, massively reducing their level of environmental pressure while still maintaining high levels of human well-being. And so this is a a huge challenge when it's shown at the national scale. But as well, we need to remember in this analysis, we're looking at nations almost as if they're like isolated uh, entities. But of course, we all know that's not the case. We are deeply connected through history, through power, through colonialism, through military power, through trade and finance rules, through ongoing resource extraction by multinational corporations, and of course, the impacts of climate change, which are overwhelmingly being caused or are responsible by wealthy, high emitting nations, but being felt first and hardest in, in the world's poorest nations. And so this is a huge challenge. How do we make, how do we get into the donut recognizing that we all have different pathways to get there? So I wanted to dive in a little bit deeper into how we, how we dive, how we collected the, well, what were the methods? And I'm just gonna focus on the downscaling of planetary boundaries here, just to walk you through a little bit of our process. And the first step is to select the ecological dimensions. And as I'm sure Kate, well, as I know Kate went over last week, this is informed by the planetary boundaries framework, which is a nine global ecological boundaries informed by the latest earth system science. So we use the planetary boundaries as an overarching framework, but of course, when you're looking to, to downscale that to the national level, there's some difficulties. So one of them is finding planetary boundary data that could also be translated to the national level. But once you get to that stage where you have a planetary boundary, you run up against a fundamental, huge ethical problem. Because if you're looking to divvy up the pie from the global to the national, how do you do that? Like, how do you define that national share of planetary boundary? And there are no correct answer there. There are different principles, there's equality. You could think of different nations having different allocations based on their needs, based on their rights to development, based on, on just current sovereignty. Should it be a nation has a, has a share based on where it stands currently, or, based on its ability to pay. So all of these are, are really great questions to which there's not a single answer. And the approach that we took was to take an equal per capita approach. And that's bearing in mind that it was actually based on an equal per capita approach right now. And this approach, although it does divide up equally among all people, it is, um, it is, it gives almost a gift to the global north because it doesn't take into account historical responsibilities for the overshoot that we've seen at the global level. So these decisions have to be made for analytical purpose though, even though there's not a right answer. And when you do so, you get to a national boundary, but that's of course only one half of the story. The other side is we wanna compare our target or our boundary to current performance. And to do that, we used an approach based on environmental footprint data and environmental footprints are consumption-based indicators that take into account the upstream environmental burdens related to, related to the production of goods and services. So, you know, all of the emissions, all of the resources, all of the waste emitted throughout the course of the life cycle of a product. And most of this data is available at the national level through what's known as multi-regional input output analysis tables. And so you then get an indicator of national environmental pressure that takes into account, most of all, international trade. Because if you're only looking at territorial measures, like within the border of a nation, then that can obscure if a nation is uh, offshoring its environmental impacts abroad. So you get your environmental pressure, your national and, and your boundary, and you divide them together. And, and with that, it equals your national overshoot. And that's what we see on the, the red wedges in each of the donuts. So just to walk you through a little bit of the methodology, 
And I also want to highlight that I led the development of a website that you can see here. It's goodlife.leeds.ac.uk, where you can compare all of the nations that were available in our analysis. And for the data nerds like me, not only is it the national donuts, but we've also enabled so that the numerical values are also available. So for example, showing here for Malawi and for Canada, each of the biophysical indicators that we measured. So CO2 emissions, phosphorus, nitrogen, etc. And similarly for all of the social indicators, uh, which I won't go into as much detail here, but I'm happy to answer any questions. But there you can see all of them in the thresholds. And again, I encourage you to visit the website and explore your own countries. Um, so with that in mind, I wanted to come back to a couple points. One of them is that as a nature of this, this bubble chart, if you will, that it's shown here, it's a binary approach. Basically what it's doing, it's measuring whether a nation is above or under a threshold or a boundary. But this approach actually almost masks some really hopeful country. So I wanted to pull them out here and you can see that there's Vietnam, who's you know somewhat of an outlier in this analysis because they're doing really very well, the closest out of any nation that we saw. Although when you look over time, just the nature of empirical analysis, there's a little bit of an accident of history because Vietnam's economic development pathway is actually growing very, very rapidly. So we're not holding them up as a necessarily as a role model, but it just jumps out in this empirical analysis. But as well, I can point to Sri Lanka, who is within all of the planetary boundaries, of course, falling short in terms of social, social performance, but doing relatively better than other nations. And then of course, Costa Rica doing very well, uh, you know, just falling short in terms of social performance and just overstepping the ecological boundaries that we measured, similarly to Colombia. Um, so I wanted to highlight those points and as well bring up a another few issues and considerations, one of which I already raised is to recognize that these analyses are national and that when you use a nation as a unit of analysis, you miss a lot of the systemic interconnections between places and their histories and the power that lie behind them. And that's just, that's just a consideration to keep in mind. And of course, those histories and their stories are hugely important. Um, also, I wanted to bring out this idea that the indicators that we've used are globally comparable so that we can take nations and we can put them next to one another rigorously and say, this indicator can be compared to that. But of course, that flattening of the experience of a nation, is that necessarily the most relevant for that nation? When it looks at itself in the mirror and it sees that donut, is it, does that reflect the, the experience that that nation feels? And oftentimes in the global north, the answer is no, because the social foundation, for example, reflects like in a nation like the UK, it says, oh, you're doing great socially. But actually, if you go to the UK, you can see huge inequalities, there's poverty, there's major systemic social issues that aren't captured when you get this globally comparable standard. Of course, questions of data availability is a huge issue. We're in this point where it's a new, we're building the metrics that we need. And right now we always say, we hope to look back in 10 years and laugh at the coarseness of, of these methods uh, based on the data that will be made available. And hopefully this process, this course, this masters will be another step towards that. And finally, this is a snapshot, but what we really wanna be looking at is of course directionality. Where are nations going? Are there any moving towards it? And this is work that I have been working on with Dan O'Neill and with others. And we're hoping to release a, a, some research soon showing some directionality in that sense. So I wanted to leave it there and I'm happy to uh, raise any questions or Great. answer any questions. Great, Andrew. I've got a lot of questions for you that generated some really, really good questions. So let's kick off with one from Neil. He said, and if you could go back to one of the red overshoots, you know, like, like a country with, well, go back to your, yeah, here we are. So Neil said, what about if you added on 
the, the one you were at before was fine. The, the one with Vietnam and everything was fine. <laughs> oh, the so joys of animations. So there many animations. <laughs> so, and this is a really good question, actually, relevant to this slide. Are these countries the future or are they a passing moment? Neil's question is, what if you were to add on some kind of arrow to show direction? And it comes to the point you just made about directionality. But we, what, we, what we're seeing here is a snapshot. What if, could, could we see direction? Does data exist to do that? Data does exist to do that. And that's exactly what the, this analysis that I've been working on together with Dan O'Neill, we've been looking at a historical snapshot going back. Uh, the analysis ended up being from 1992 to the most recent data available, which just is again, an indication of how far we need to go, which tends to, right now it's around 2015, 2016. And we were looking at time trends and looking at how nations are moving over time and to answer the yeah in what comes out of this analysis is essentially that there are no nations necessarily moving towards the donut essentially the pathway that you see is from imagine if they're all moving from the bottom left up that curve transgressing boundaries faster than they start to before they start to achieve social threshold so the direction of development has been resource intensive and that there's this this idea that you know you need to trash the environment in order to have the condition the material conditions necessary to to live a good life and that has in the 20th century been the biz, the development model and what we need to do is transform that and so costa rica for example is nestled in there in the time series analysis what we do see over time is that costa rica consistently transforms resources into well-being more efficiently than any other nation but at the same time their direction of movement is also moving towards becoming more unsustainable over time and, and andrew while we're there someone saying where where is bhutan or where would bhutan be is it on the chart bhutan is not on that chart i believe because in this case the the analysis is restricted to nations with population less than 1 million or more than 1 million sorry and and so bhutan is is not included in the analysis it's a good question though right one for the future so i'm going to come back to a comment that ananya made uh, a couple of comments and it's good you've got this slide up she said she said, what I'm seeing here is that high income countries are managing to achieve a strong performance on the social foundation, basically by overshooting planetary boundaries. And that has an impact directly on the low income nations and through climate change and all sorts of things. We actually know that that is undermining their ability to achieve the social foundation. So there are that there are really deep interconnectednesses here. And then a very profound question she was asking sort of, you know, who, is it? Could we say it's easier for high income countries to make that shift to the donut than it is for the low income countries to get there or the middle income? They've got a double whammy challenge of meeting the needs of all and coming back within the needs of the planet. I mean, this, of course, is the existential question. And, and, and Lisa said, why is there no nation in the donut? Andrew, do you want to offer any existential remarks on these very big questions? These are huge questions. I would point towards I mean, there's quite a bit of research demonstrating that the resources required to actually achieve a reasonable level of social provisioning is actually not that high. Like if you picture a lot of the, the relationships, if you take almost any environmental indicator and a social indicator, what you see is this, this curve, this diminishing returns between resource use where at very low levels of resource use, you get a big increase in social performance as, as that level of resource use increases, but up only up to a point after which there's an inflection and a turning point and the relationship essentially breaks down so that you, for more resources that you use, you get very little increase, if any, in terms of social performance. So what we argue is that, you know, for many, many high, consuming nations with very high environmental footprints, they could, based on these relationships, reduce that resource use dramatically with little effect on human well-being. So it may be the case that it's, that it's uh, easier for high income nations, as you say. At the same time, we're, back, we're banging up against what those resources are being used for, which in many cases is to, for an entrenched status quo that's 
you know, the opportunities and values and accumulation that's going to a tiny elite and that facing that status quo and facing that, that elite and, and capital accumul accumulation is a challenge. And so it's not necessarily easy really for anyone, I don't think. Okay, we've got four more minutes. And since you are a self-declared data geek, I'm gonna ask you two data questions. One from Lorenz. Do the CO2 emissions take into account tourist emissions? Or let's say, did they even take into account airplane flights to get to countries, including ones like Costa Rica, because that's the main industry. So if we're not taking account of tourism, and the flights, so are airplane flights included in, in CO2? Great question. Um, in this data set, they are not actually from international aviation and, and bunker fuels. So maritime, uh, maritime shipping, those CO2 emissions are not allocated to nations. They stand, they stand apart. And so that's a great question. And it's a great one that just shows the limits of the data that are available and therefore what you're doing is working with what is available and 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 it's political because until it's available we can't show the full impact of people on each other okay i'm gonna give one very technical question here from tom Hasler. Are you ready for this andrew if a nation emits 10 units of carbon and it supports an agricultural practice that sequesters 12 units of carbon through things like no-till agriculture would your data show the net of this and if yes how and if not why not so this data is consumption based so it would be it's it's not accounting for the territorial emission so if a nation we're looking at final consumption so if if the consumption of goods and services of the residents of the nation are 10 units it wouldn't really be comparable to to what occurs within the territory, if that makes sense at all. Uh, Great, I'm, I'm gonna ask you a last question, Andrew. Over the next five years, what is, as a data geek, what do you really want to become available so that you can really supercharge these analyses? What would, what would be a game changer in terms of data for this? Ooh, ooh, that gets my back all, all tingly. Um, <laughs> That's a great question. What would I love to see? Um, oh, I mean, getting more current data is, I believe, could be very, very helpful for, for these types of analyses. Often, as I mentioned, we're dealing with 2015, 2016 right now, and we're dealing with an uh, economic system that's based on GDP indicators which are being pumped out quarterly so it's just when we're speaking with policymakers and analysts from a data perspective presenting data from 2016 is is not great and so if we could really get to work making these indicators available on a much more timely basis at least like you know last year that would be a huge help fantastic let's let's hope these dreams come true Go, go wish for it and you never know when it might show up. Well, I'm gonna say, I'm really glad that there's quite a few questions popping up where people are saying, is it possible to do this at a regional level or a local level? And that's exactly what we're going to go on to do. So if Andrew, if you could unshare, I will then reshare. We've practiced this folks, as you can see, um, because what Andrew was sharing there was, um, as, as he explained, national donuts derived from an internationally comparable data set. And it means that when you look at any one country, it might not quite look, it might not quite look enough like your country because it's coming from something that's been developed globally. And what if we want to go local? What if we want to develop something from within that really reflects the reality of place? So this is what I'm gonna come and share with us. And I'm gonna talk about the city because this work that we did at Deal began with the C40, the, the network of, um, let me call them, climate ambitious cities worldwide. The C40 approached us and said, we want to use your donut model with our most ambitious cities. So we've worked together and begun by downscaling the donut to the level of a global north city. So let's begin there. But I invite you wherever you are to think of a city that you have lived in, that you're near, that you love, that you hate, that you're connected to, and listen to this through the lens of that city. 
So the question would be, can our city live within the donor or indeed our province or our neighborhood or town? Well, what we're doing at DEAL is unrolling the donut, opening that space out. Let's, let's break it open like breaking the bread and open that space up. Because when we do that, we create a nice space between the social foundation and the ecological season where we can start to envision the future. We can turn it into a canvas. And as you can see, there's a focus on here, your city, and its relation to the world. So it's about here and the world, always embedded in place. And we can turn it into a canvas for imagining. So I'm going to take us on a tour of that. And what I'm sharing with you right now is a city that deal is current, uh, sorry, not a city. It's a tool that we are currently developing and is going to be released soon that people will then be able to use. But this is a preview. So the city donut. Here's the question that we invite all ambitious 21st century places to ask themselves. How can our city or province or town become a home to thriving people in a thriving place? while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet. Now that breaks down into what we call the four lenses of a portrait. And I'm gonna just talk us briefly through those four lenses. First of all, how can all the people of our city thrive? This is the local social lens. It's about the social foundation for all in this place. Add to that, how can our city be as generous as the wildland next door? It's the local ecological as aspiration for this place. These are local aspirations, thriving people in a thriving place. And I'm going to come back and say more about what they mean, but we must always put them in the context of global responsibility. So think of the way your city is connected through global supply chains of food and clothing, electronics, consumer goods, construction materials to those planetary boundaries that overshoot Andrew was showing. How can your city respect the health of the whole planet and come back within planetary boundaries and then still think of those global supply chains and this time, not the material that flows through them, but now think of the people who work in them and ask, how can our city respect the well-being of all people? These are the four lenses. Now we're going to go in another layer deeper. So how can the all the people of our city thrive? Let's start by asking, who are all the people of our city who've been here for centuries, who've been here for decades, who've just arrived? people of all cultures and backgrounds and stories and traditions, but who call this city home. So respecting that full variety and diversity of people. Now, along the bottom, you've got the icons that symbolize the core elements of the social foundation in a place. What would it mean to gather data in your city about sufficient food for all? good water for all, health for all, education, decent education, good housing, access to clean energy, good connectivity, mobility for all, strong sense of community, culture, decent work or income if you don't have it, social equity in terms of income inequalities, but also equality and diversity of race, gender, class, background, nationality, ethnicity, political voice for all people and peace and justice. What would it look like in your place to say, well, what is, this, what is the, the, the threshold that we're aiming for? What's the standard of living that we would call thriving? And does the data exist? And what, what, what's the best available data? You'd actually be surprised how hard it is to gather data on all of these, even in some of the world's richest cities. So we can ask more uh, general or more uh, discursive questions like, what does thriving mean to people here? Let's have a city conversation. What has COVID-19 made visible that was always there, but now we see it and can act on it? And which of our cultural aspects will be our greatest strength? If we're gonna pivot as a place, if we're gonna turn, we need to draw on the values we've always held, whether it's, whether it's pride in our diversity, whether it's pride in our historical traditions, our strong sense of community or sense of place, those are the values that will enable us to pivot and enable everybody to thrive. Then let's come to the question of how can our city be as generous as the wildland next door? This comes from the work of the biomimicry thinker Janine Benyus, who worked with us on this framework. So if Janine came to your city, she'd say, take me to the wildland next door. Where is the healthy, intact ecosystem of this place? Whether you're in a, on a plateau or in a valley, in the tropics, in a desert, in the Arctic Circle, nature has a genius for thriving here. How can we learn from that? How could our city mimic nature's generosity? Because everywhere nature knows how to cleanse the air, house biodiversity and store carbon, cycle water and harvest energy, regulate the temperature, build and protect soil 
and enhance the well-being of humans as we connect with the rest of the living world. So how could your city store carbon and house wildlife? We know the power of trees. How could your city harvest solar energy, whether through panels or through urban rooftop farming? How can your city manage water and build soil through, for example, being a sponge city, absorbing floods? And of course, a city that can live as part of the ecosystem will have greater climate adaptation and resilience in the face of those challenges. What would it mean to set the bar to be as generous as nature and measure that from the wildland next door? Literally, how much does the forest sequester carbon? How many diverse species are here? How does the forest cool the air from the treetops to the forest floor? And let's take those metrics and make them the performance standards for our city. This wild ambition of cooling the air, cleansing the air, housing biodiversity, storing carbon like the wildland. I find this beautiful because it's so ambitious but utterly natural. And of course it invites us to do amazing design innovations. So those are the local aspirations. Now, how can our city help respect the health of the whole planet? I want to remind us that we began here in the cities of the global north and they'll all have national uh, national donuts that look a bit like the one I'm showing now in overshoot. So if the nation's in overshoot, you can bet the city's in overshoot. So we're beginning with a recognition that these are cities that must come back within the donut. These we're seeing here are the nine planetary boundaries and we're measuring our consumption based impact. So not just the carbon that we emit here, but all the carbon that's embedded in our imported clothing and food and electronics and construction materials. So how can we transform mobility here in a way that will improve local life and thriving in a way that will improve the local econo ecology and will improve and reduce our impact on the planet. How do we create a circular economy? You remember last week I shared this example from Amsterdam, circular construction so that we reduce our material footprint on the world. How do we transform food systems so that we are having a lower fertilizer impact, water, land use change on the whole world because we build more resilience here? And then again, thinking of these global supply chains, I ask every city, which corporations are based in your city and what are the business models by which they succeed? They're bringing prosperity to your city, but what are the ways that they are affecting the employment and the rights of communities and people worldwide? What are the multinational brands and retailers selling products in your city? Selling consumption goods that have been made worldwide now on sale to the people of the city because we know that the labor behind the label is not as pretty as the brand on the box. And we need to make sure that we are living in ways through companies, through retailers and through city procurement that respects the rights of workers worldwide. Many cities still say to us when we show them this lens, oh, that's beyond our control, that's beyond our mandate. Well, the same cities would have said the same thing about carbon emissions a decade ago. This is changing. This may seem beyond our control, but there were always things we can do. And so the rise of social procurement is key. And I think it's going to be the big new trend over this decade. So let's pull back. Now we've got the four lenses. And in each one, you could think, how would we set the target for thriving here? How would we gather the data that would enable us to start measuring whether or not we're getting there? It's local. So it's very different from what Andrew was showing because that was from a globally created database that's generated nation by nation by nation. This is created from within as a conversation of a place, gathering the information of this place and its stories and whatever data we can generate. And that, of course, is part of the transformatory process. So we could put your city's housing future at the center of this. Somebody was asking in the chat earlier, could we do a sectoral policy? This is how I believe we could do it. Put the city's housing future or transport or food, any issue you want to bring and ask how could we create housing here that is affordable for the neighborhood, like in Vienna, that creates community, that enables parents to look after their children, that enables people to live close to the places they work. Great housing for community, but also great housing that brings back nature, that stores timber because it's made of wood, that has a green roof, that gathers rainwater, that makes people feel like they're nestled in nature and enhances their well-being. How could we also reduce our impact on the planet? Can these be built in a circular way where materials are refurbished and reused? Can we install solar panels or urban farms on the rooftops to harvest that solar energy? And then think of the people working in global supply chains, whether they're making cement in factories across the world 
or there may be migrant labor coming to the city for the construction sector. We know very vulnerable workers. How can their rights be respected in the way we go forward? You could put this on the map and then you could say, let's have a great big workshop activity. What are our city's targets already? What have we already committed to doing? Where are we already in motion? Let's celebrate what's happening. Where are the key challenges where we know we need to make transformation? Let's think of some new initiatives and see how everything is connected. We've done workshops like these with city policymakers in cities like Philadelphia, Portland and Amsterdam. You can see this was pre-COVID. This was September 2019. We gathered policymakers and community members and they sat around this portrait and explored it and got to know it. And we had already brought the city's targets as the standard they were aspiring to. We had already brought the best available data and quantified as we could their city portrait. And then they were looking at where they were and where they needed to get to. And what they often said was, if we're going to work in this holistic way, we need to transform the way we're working ourselves. We need to go beyond just transforming the city. We need to transform our institutions. And I'm gonna come back and say more about that in a minute. So Amsterdam was the first city. Here's a snapshot of their city portrait. You can see that red overshoot on planetary boundaries. They had conversations to get familiar with the concepts. They created the Amsterdam donut, came up with a new vision for the city to be a thriving, inclusive, regenerative city for all residents while respecting planetary boundaries. And then that's the new purpose. So they've got a mirror, which is the portrait. They've got a mission, which is that vision. But then we said there were eight M's. You've got to mobilize the change makers in your place around this process. Map onto it what's already in action. Celebrate that motion. Use this to transform the mindset. We're not about endless growth. We're about thriving. And this is what it looks like. Build momentum over time with design sprints and showing that the policy is getting put into practice. Monitor year on year, are we making progress or not? And we said, mm -mm, it has to be irresistible. It has to be fun and compelling. People have to want to be part of this. So Amsterdam put the donut at the center of their circular strategy. Is This is the way they've downscaled it and then turning it into policy, being 50% circular by 2030 and putting that procurement into government contracts next year. And then they've created new metrics. Remember last week I said, we need to go from being linear and degenerative to circular and regenerative. So they need new metrics. Are we becoming circular? Are we becoming regenerative? Amsterdam adopted the donut in April, 2020 at the height of COVID. They did it because they said, as we emerge from the emergency, we need a vision of where we want to go. We then published the methodology that we use to create this portrait so that others could adopt it. And it's been picked up by so many people and places worldwide. And, and we believe this is only just beginning. So we're learning so much from how people are choosing to pick it up. A couple of examples coming. Amsterdam also had a rich network of change makers in universities and startups and communities and civic networks. And they created the Amsterdam Donut Coalition, uh, a, a residents and citizens response to the government engaging too. So they had both the government led and the community led, and that's got power. They've inspired many other places to do the same. And now these groups are self-organizing and supporting and learning together. If wherever you are, you want to create one of these, you can, and you can launch it on Deal's platform and you could become part of this community. So in the Brussels capital region, the Secretary of State for Economic Transition, Barbara Tracht, contacted us and said, I want a donut for Brussels. We said, contact a local change maker organization embedded in your region. You need to work with people who are part of your networks already. And they did and they contacted Confluence who worked together to create this beautiful visualization of the four lenses of Brussels donut. In Cornwall in the UK, the county decided to create a decision-making wheel. You can see that it's based on the donut, just two lenses involved here. We'd like to see four, but this is a great initiative, using it for every infrastructural decision. Are we overshooting planetary boundaries and how can we improve the decision? How can we design this better for people? And then in Melbourne, in Australia, they've gone through a big process, 40 organizations, 600 people involved in a conversation about what does it mean to have a thriving, regenerative Melbourne. So they are co-creating this vision of thriving in their city from a community conversation up. So I'm going to stop there because I'm going to hand back to Andrew, who's going to tell you. I've, I've talked all about places in the global north, which is where we began. But of course, there is so much inspiration elsewhere. And Andrew's going to share stories from what's happening with us and colleagues in the global south. 
I am indeed. Thank you, Kate. Let me dive right in. So moving moving on from, from what Kate just described. So we published this methodological guide on creating city portraits based on this methodology at, that was designed primarily with Global North cities in mind. And within that, actually, we identified, uh, let me just see if I can make this work. We actually identified our vision for further development of this methodology. We published this as a version zero almost. What we wanted to do is get it out there so that others could pick it up, could adapt it, could innovate with it. And, and just, we believe that there's such powerful, you know, others can inspire others in so many different ways. There's power in that. So how do we get these tools out? But we identified that, you know, a global South context, which is of course more than the majority of humanity, there are different priorities, there are different needs. So how can we adapt this, this methodology to take those into account and better reflect those needs and those priorities and their histories and interests and perspectives? And as well, given that this was done essentially at the city level, how can we also think about different scales from neighborhoods to towns, to cities, to regions, as well as the nations, again, focused on these four lenses rather than the two lens approach that I was presenting earlier. So again, really focusing on how can we be most, how can, instead of, it's almost giving up this idea of comparability in order to focus on identifying entry points for that place, taking into, its, into account its specific context. So this is what we set up and we said, okay, well, uh, we're in Europe and we're not based in the global south. So we are certainly not in a position to just say, here's the methodology. So what we wanted to do was identify a group of partners and luckily and gratefully, we were approached. And one of the key principles of Donut Economics Action Lab is going where the energy is. And actually people from across the global south, different groups and initiatives from Costa Rica to Malaysia, Bangladesh, India, and others, approached us saying, hey, this methodology is interesting. We like to, we think that it could be useful for our context. And we said, hey, that's great. But of course, this was designed with the Global North in mind. So why don't we work together to think about co-creating a methodology that, that can be adapted to this context as we talk. So that's what we have been doing. That's what we started out to do. And the co-creative process is quite simple. We are building, we built this core team having a, a series of online workshops where we come together from across the world. And the whole purpose of it is to eventually work towards creating more methodological guidance so that others can say, okay, now this speaks to my context and my priorities. It's not gonna provide answers, of course, but what it does provide is a methodological steps and examples and illustrations to keep in mind for others who want to pick up this methodology to do so. so the idea is that we will be publishing that, that methodology, the version, version one or version two, uh, whichever way you think of it, very soon. And so I'd like to just touch briefly on what we've been doing over this process. Here's the team at work. Our focus is downscaling the donut for the context, needs, and interests of the Global South. And it's a beautiful group of, of just really inspiring, energetic individuals. And it's, as Kate just showed, it's focused on these four lenses. And what we're doing is taking a deep dive through each of the sessions into the lenses and thinking about, in all cases, what implications for adapting this methodology arise in a Global South context. And of course, also in the session five was looking at interconnections and synergies across the lenses as well. And we, it wasn't part of the plan actually, but we then realized that we had this core group of, of change makers who were leading initiatives in their various places. And we realized we needed another session in order to hear from them, hear their context and what they were already putting into practice and what questions they could feel inspired that the group we had formed would be able to answer. So this is the process that we have ongoing. I just wanted to touch on a few issues that came out immediately. One is about scale, another questions around power, and others around diversity. And what we've sound, found so far is that this framework, at least from what we found, it's capable of holding these deep questions around power, around history, around colonialism, 
as well as the transformative action that's needed. So in, around scale, we thought about neighborhoods, towns, cities, regions, and nations, and the criteria for choosing, again, it's a methodological adaptation. What are the criteria for choosing the effective scale for localizing the donut? Is it the governance? Is it interconnections? Uh, for example, is a place deeply connected with other areas? Is it a bioregion, a watershed? Uh, maybe it's an island. Or what else? What other criteria could come? So this is where we were coming together to consider different questions along these lines. When it comes to power, there's a methodology that Kate will be speaking to soon around powers to act. What can cities do in terms of redesigning their institutions? And diversity, again, it's come up a couple times already. The portrait, the four lens methodology, it doesn't aim to be comparable across places. We believe that each portrait will be different because each place is different and unique with a different history and context. And we asked the, the participants at the beginning, given that we're adapting the donut, this methodology, what would be an alternative to the, from the context and the culture that you're in? using food as an example. And we were blown away by these responses. So I wanted to share them here with you all. And I would encourage, invite you to ask the same questions. If you wanted to throw them in the chat box, we can keep building our database of, of donut alternatives around the world. Now, if we dive into the practicalities again, where this is a methodology for creating a city portrait, we can think in the global north, this is Amsterdam once again, we're looking at local indicators and data. And how do we select indicators that offer this holistic snapshot to discuss complex issues? So we're not aiming to have a comprehensive statistical state of the city report. What it's aiming to do is use a judicious, pertinent use of statistics to highlight key issues for a city. So, but in each case, the gray, dark gray boxes here are the city targets and the light gray are the city performance. And I realize that you can't, of course, see that. But when we think of a Global South adaptation, Amsterdam, Portland, Philadelphia, Brussels, other cities, these are some of the most data rich places in the world. And when we move to a Global South context, what indicators and data could be gathered or created? Would it be, especially if there are no data available? Can we use photos? Can we use quotes? Should we use focus groups, citizens assemblies, crowdsourcing data, or as well looking further up in terms of international and national databases? And this is an example from, from Uganda. It's in the peer reviewed literature actually of, of some researchers who work together with youth in a photojournalism research, identifying for each of the dimensions of the donut instances based, given that they didn't have quantitative hard data, they used photos to illustrate the experience in their, in their city and in their place. Finally, if that was at the local level, when we think of the global, again, there are adaptations that come up where as Kate presented, the question was how can this place respect the health of the whole planet? When we think of mobility, housing, construction, food, all of those global supply chains. And of course the impacts that that has on on, on the planet worldwide. But as well from the Global South per perspective, we can recognize that there are two-way relationships, not just in the Global South, of course, also in the Global North, but it's seemingly more pertinent in the Global South because, and we can ask the question, how can the degradation of planetary health that's ongoing due to historical responsibilities, how is that impacting this place? And how can we recognize those two-way interactions? And if so, what are the major impacts and what are the dimensions that we could look at? We can think of coral reef bleaching and ocean dead zones, sea level rise and heat waves. And, and what else? And we believe that this is, these are pertinent questions to be raising, particularly in a Global South context. And similarly for indicators and data, our existing methods find are the relevant data sources if none also, what else do we do? And how do we make visible these impacts through data sources, through globally available data uh, in terms of sea level rise, in terms of heat, uh, wet bulb days, for example, changes over time uh, when it comes to international databases. And if there are none, then what else can be used? 
So I wanted to also touch on a few examples of things that are ongoing, one of which I'll highlight here in Barbados. There's a group called Regenerate Barbados, just had an activity recently, and you can see at the in the top image, it's Senator Crystal Drake's. And I just love this because she's mobilizing the networks that are already ongoing, where you can see Melbourne, you can see Amsterdam, as well Curacao and others. And below it's very much it's using this moment that we're all living in to recognize that we have an opportunity for transformative action there's also in costa rica uh, costa rica regenerativa is a group that we've been working with quite closely in terms of adopting donut economics thinking and principles we have in bangladesh uh, people involved in this core team led by uh, Professor Salim al Khuk and uh, just a leading, a leading researcher there. In Brazil, there's an organization called Live Mundi, who's looking at downscaling the donut using this methodology to a favela called Peña, which is, which is shown here. And in Malaysia, uh, a changemaker who has developed essentially a project-based approach to downscaling the donut, which we're not saying is the only way to do things, but just an example of how, how people can take these initiatives and run with them, in this case, in Malaysia. And that's a cue for me to jump in and say that one of the exciting things, somebody was just asking in the chat, what's the smallest scale you've seen? And I was saying, well, we're gonna see that in week four. So across the global North and the global South, we're just so inspired by the incredible initiatives that are happening as Andrew just shared and I shared. And in our fourth week together in this course, we are going to be bringing some of those change makers because it's one thing of us to talk about it, but you wanna hear from them and learn from them, how they're putting it into practice, whether it's Laura Malcher, part of the team in Brussels, who've done some wonderful ways of downscaling the donut there, whether it's the fabulous Imi Kaur in Civic Square in Birmingham, this wonderful donut shaped room, they just put it up last week and they're doing it very much at the scale of a community, right street to street level. And then Juan Carlos Goyo for Curacao has done the first island donut for Curacao. So we're gonna be bringing those change makers to, to share their ideas with you. If we, and now what we're gonna do, I know there's so many questions and ideas being sprung up now, but what we're gonna do is go into breakout rooms. So if we go to the next slide, right, we're gonna invite you to go into breakout rooms. And as we did last week, to go into the room, the number of the slide that aligns with the group that you're in. And just, we've asked these two very, very, very broad questions, okay? Because there's so many interests here. So how could downscaling the donut this way, this, this four lensed approach, how could this be useful in your context? If you, want, if you were to do it there, just, just inspire people and inspire all of us with possibilities that you can see that it could be done. And then whether you've got ideas or suggestions for improving or extending the approach, come on, inspire us with things we haven't seen yet, ideas of what also could be done, because it may well end up as part of the frame. So I remember that last week, some people, quite a lot of people said there was trouble using the Google Slides that we sent. So we've got a special method this week you're gonna have 25 minutes for discussions, come back with some great ideas. And so that we don't overload the Google Slides, we've trying, we're innovating every time. So we've made two sets of Google Slides. So you'll be clear, so it, it halves the volume straight away. So if you find yourself going into breakout room between numbers one and 20, click on that first link I put for set A. If you're put, put in breakout room 21 to 40, go into that second group. And then when you're in your group, not everybody in the group needs to open the Google Slides. You don't all need to be looking. Here's what I recommend. Somebody in the group who's happy not to do typing, but just to talk and listen, somebody share your screen and share that slide so that everybody's looking at the slide on your screen. And then one maximum, two other people say, I'm happy to take notes for the group. So they could also open the Google Slides, see it on their screen, on their own computer and type in on behalf of everybody if that makes sense. So that we're trying to minimize or try to at least reduce the number of people all trying to use the Google Sheets at the same time. And if there's anyone who's really technical about this and has got a great idea for how to do this even better next week, you are so welcome to share in the chat box. We're, we're learning a lot this way. So we're gonna go into the breakout rooms. Richard's in a minute going to send you a link. Notice which room you're in. Go to the correct set of slides. Go to the slide with the number in the corner and you'll see on all the slides that at the end of, of your set of slides, you can see in the bottom, 
there's the three slides of unrolling the donut, the four lenses, and then diving in so that you've got that in front of you if you want to remind yourself. So we invite you to go and have amazing conversations. How could this be useful? What is bubbling away in your brain? And what suggestions and ideas do you have? Welcome back. We've seen that you've been having great conversations. We can, of course, see what's happening in the Google Slides. And I have to say there are few things more inspiring than seeing these Google Slides just bubbling with conversations and ideas. So many people coming up with thoughts and inspirations. It's fantastic. So what we're going to do, obviously, we can't share the full richness of everything you've generated in those slides. But what we'd like to do now is to invite you to put in the chat box examples, really specific examples, if you, if you had one, of how you see this downscaling approach of four lenses, how this could be useful in your context. And we invite you just to put some examples of, I could do this, we could use it here, we could use it like that, in the chat box. Just share with us right now those examples, and then we'll come to the questions in a minute. We'd love to see a stream of inspirations see them come through. We've got about 10 minutes in which Andrew and I are going to respond to your suggestions and your questions. So let's hear first ideas from what you thought. I would love to use this downscaled framework in this context where I am. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Oh my goodness. And it begins. <laughs> um, let me see if I can pull something out here uh, before it scrolls off my screen. Um, so giving it as a framework, Hannah Ballard says, giving it as a framework for kids and young people to apply to their schools and neighborhoods as they are ready to make the change. So the inspiration from education, that's really something that we, uh, of course, we've been speaking at the city scale, but as well, there's very much a question of, of you know, applications to a school. How can we think of these four lenses, these four questions through the, the image of, an educational institution, for example, a university, a school, and think of you know the opportunities to, to engage with education through that. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, that my children go to a local secondary school here in Oxford, which was doing an event about imagining their school in 2050. And so I did a first presentation of imagining that school through the four lenses of the donut. And we're going to be publishing that tool. It's those four lenses, but just very specifically created around schools. We're going to publish that tool. And I know there are lots of teachers who are also part of Deal's community who are going to co-create with us, turning that into a really fantastically useful resource for teachers and schools. So I'm going to pick up a couple of things I've seen popping up in the chat box. Somebody said, I'd really like to use this in my business. So next week, we're going to talk all about the donut, when business meets the donut and how you could use it. So hold that one there. And then also someone said, in my household, and I think that's a great one. And again, it's a tool we want to create that we all live in a household where we have an electricity supply, where food is coming in, where we're purchasing things that are coming into our house. We generate waste. It goes out in a stream. We have distribution of unpaid caring work in the household. So many things we can explore through our household, how we shop and travel and eat and invest and divest and vote and protest and volunteer as members of a household. So again, we think that's a wonderful, wonderful, tiny level to bring it to the unit of the household. How do we live here? And you could put your own home at the center of that canvas of the four lenses and ask, how does my household contribute to a thriving community? How does it contribute to the ecology of this place? How does it respect the health of the whole planet? How does my household respect the well-being of people worldwide? There are things we all know we can do in all four of those boxes to bring our own homes more into the donut. Well, that's, that's great. I'm just gonna keep picking out things here. Um, I saw some uh, several comments on how the portrait could be very useful as an opportunity to bridge between groups, uh, such as politicians, such as civil society, and that's very much something that we've been observing as well as Kate was mentioning in Amsterdam, uh, how the city is working together at the, at the municipality level using the portrait. But now the Amsterdam Donor Coalition is also using the same portrait tools to explore at the neighborhood level questions and around, you know, what does it mean to, 
to generate meaningful community-based action and the interactions of course with the city being uh, hugely ripe for just fertile grounds for transformative action. Um, and also similarly, I just mentioned Donut, Amsterdam Donut Co Coalition, but I've been seeing this idea of networks and regional donut networks. That's something as also came up where these networks are popping up left and right. And we were just so thrilled to see them actually self-organizing. And now they have a Slack group. There's a group, there's monthly meetings where different groups share their challenges, share their experiences with one another and generate this learning. And that's a very open group and it's actually led by the community manager of the Amsterdam Donut Coalition as well. So if you formed a group, then get in touch with us or get in touch with her to, to be part of that larger network. Yes, and piggy straight up on that, I can see Olga is saying, I would like to know if somebody from Geneva or Switzerland wants to work on a donut in Geneva. So Olga and anybody who has that idea for where you are, first thing you can do is go to Deal's platform. And we're delighted to say we've got a new thing on our platform. That if you look at the members, there's now a map that shows you where all the members are worldwide. So you could just go and see who are the members of Deal's community in your city or region or nation. You can contact them directly if they've shared their contact details on our platform. So right there, you can find people from your place who already want to share these ideas. Great start to a network. If you bring a group of people together, whether you meet them in this course or on Deal's platform, you can then post an event on our platform. Anyone can post an event. So you can say, hi, we are, we are collaborating and meeting for the first time to talk about doing a donut in Geneva. And that will be on Deal's platform and all the members will see it. And that's a great way. And you can tweet it or share it on Facebook or wherever you share things. Great way to bring people together. Many, many of the local groups have begun to form that way. I'm gonna pick up a question from, uh, a suggestion from Joy, which I thought was lovely to say, make the donut 3D. And the third dimension should be the faces, the stories, the histories, the anecdotes, the reality of people's lives. That's beautiful. We were calling it making a city selfie making this portrait yourself in the city and bringing, you know, I, I like to imagine if, if, if the city portrait of the four lenses was on display in the city hall, what would we see? We don't just want to see statistics. We want to see photographs. Can I, can I press a button and hear somebody's story? Can I see examples of action? Can I find networks and connections? So how could you make this so beautifully interactive and alive? That's great. I'm just going to continue seeing, I'm seeing a lot of comments around education and, and the role of the youth. Um, but similarly, just picking up on what Kate just spoke about this from Gayla, the question around, or comment almost around expanding every city conversation, such as one on housing or tree codes about, about how each of these can impact the planetary boundaries. And how does it contribute to thriving of people in the community or not? To me, that's just, it seems like you really understand the fundamental essence of the portrait from that, where it's local, it's global, and it's social, and it's ecological. Uh, wonderful. So now I'm going to invite everybody to now start posting the chat box from the other half of your breakout session. Are there any suggestions or ideas that you'd say, Yes, the four lenses is great, and, 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 and. Of course, there's some coming out already, but please keep bringing these here. And I'm gonna pick up on a, a comment that Alicia made, um, an art competition. Wonderful idea. In fact, one of the tools on our platform is called Donut Dreams, and it's just two concentric circles, and it invites anybody and children to draw inside that empty space of the donut, the world that you would see if we lived in the donut. And that could be done as a competition um, it's a lovely idea. There's so many ways that this could be turned into art that brings it right close to people's inspiration and lives. Several people have asked if we, if we have a slide, so let me just say again very clearly, a PDF of all the slides from today are going to be shared on the Ubiquity University site. Of course we're going to share them. We're not flying these things past you and, and you having to desperately do screenshots. They're all shared so that you can go back over them and really dive deeper into them and consider them. Make huge seeing, donut art around cities. Love the idea. Go for it, Andrew. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, I would love to see that too. Or even the main square. It doesn't have to be City Hall, but just the space where everybody goes. Mm. I'd love to see it. Um, 
and seeing I it come, from, I come from a rainy country, so I always think about indoors, but you're absolutely right. Right, right. Well, well a waterproof donut. That's the... <laughs> um, I'm seeing a comment from Kate Goodwin around citizen assemblies uh, and how useful they could be for intractable problems. And I think that that's, uh, you know, that's not directly addressed by the donut portrait. It almost comes as a segue for the next step of when we think about, okay, if the portrait's like a, a mirror, then how can we take into account and redesign our institutions so that they can actually deal with this holistic perspective that we're bringing? And citizens' assemblies, I think, is a key part of, of thinking about the governance of, of a place or a city. So I'm gonna pick on Paul's point, include the non-human world, elements, plants, animals, insects, and beyond as agents and beings who needs and contributions need to be considered in the model. I think that's a really profound point. And as I said in last week's sessions, one of my own critiques of the donut is that it puts humanity and all of humanity's needs at the center, but we don't bring in the rest of the living world. And what a radical idea of what would it mean to bring all living beings into the center of the donut? How would we then listen and communicate and talk to each other and somehow my first thought of that is if you did that first through an art competition because I think this isn't going to come from a rational place it's going to come from a exploratory creative deep listening place so there we are I just paired up an art competition with Paul's suggestion of bringing the rest of the of the living world in there with us um I'm so wonderful that these ideas keep on coming yeah Grace and Perry could lead that well that would be fabulous okay so one of the last comments I made when I shared the picture of the city policymakers all sitting around donut tables is that they came and Amsterdam came back to us very quickly and said, this is amazing. We want to do this. But we know that if as a city we're going to live in the donut, the way that we're organized right now is never going to get us there. We need to transform our own institutions, our own organizations. How do we do that? And so what I'm going to do is just share with you the last content that we you know, the ideas that we want to bring today. I've also seen people in the chat box saying universities really need to look deeply at themselves. And so I'm going to be talking about the design of cities, but I invite you to listen to what I'm sharing next in terms of the design, design of all institutions, because it's relevant to all. So I'm going to go back to showing my screen for the last time today. And I'm going to pick up here. The deep design of cities. Now, I've I've had such amazing conversation with city policymakers over the last couple of years as we've explored using the donut there, and what so many of them have said is, you know, what we've inherited this mindset that tells us that we're supposed to focus on the growth of our city. We've inherited the assumption that the success of our city, sometimes told to us by the national government, the success of our city is growth, and we need to look at city GDP, and that means we're doing well. And that's coming from outside. But when we actually talk with the residents of this place, it's a completely different vision. We want to say, how do we make our city thrive? So instead of using that expansion, we want to use the thriving of dynamic balance in the donut. Now to have a city that's in service of growth is very, very different to have a city that's in service of thriving. And so we've asked ourselves, what, what are the design traits of places, of institutions and organizations that leave them facing that old question of growth? And what are the ones that enable them to pivot towards thriving? So now think of either a city institution, I'm talking about the city officials and the government, or you can think if you want through the lens of a university or an organization, how can we pivot from serving growth to serving thriving? We believe there are five key institutional organizational design traits that really take us to the heart of what enables us to choose what we serve. And I'm gonna just prevent, present some examples from each. So if you want to be in service of thriving, let's start with purpose. As I shared, Amsterdam has adopted the donut. They've made their own orange version. That's very powerful. They made the donut in the city colors. They've come to possess it. And they've created this new purpose for themselves. That is a powerful act of words. Melbourne have also created their own beautiful cartoon drawing of the donut, and they've created their own statement of what thriving means. So you start with vision and purpose and ambition. And this of course is where a lot of leadership can kick in in terms of showing that we can have this vision. 
Then let's take it down to networks. How is the city connected to its residents? And it can embrace that and enrich that through citizens' assemblies, for example. How is it connected to industries in the city? How can the city serve to bring them together through recognizing the interconnections possible in a circular economy and create a circular city scan, which no one company is going to do? So the city can play that role of coordinating and bringing together so you can begin to create circularity. How can the city join progressive networks with other cities like ICLE, the, the network of local governments focused on sustainability, but there are many, many. Of course, joining this course at Ubiquity University for each one of us is like joining a progressive network of fellow change makers, and we all see what happens in that chat box. So networks, how do you relate to others and hold yourself to your values? Governance, how do you use rules, practices, metrics, norms, culture to change things? Amsterdam has used ambitious regulation on circularity and that sends a long loud legal message to business but other places do it in other ways finland used experimental policy making we don't know which policies will work and which won't we'll only find out by trying so let's try three four five different versions and the ones that work we will then pursue in bogota a lovely example of using humor and for behavior change so it's not hard rules governance it's soft governance using clowns to mock people who are breaking the traffic rules it actually worked now let's go deeper deeper because we're going to talk about ownership who owns the sources of wealth creation in this place we heard about the story of vienna last week the land and the housing is owned by the city and its cooperatives and that makes all the difference in terms of accessibility. The city of Paris privatized its water supplies in the 1980s and then realized that that was missing so much potential and revenue and purposing they brought it back under public control. Barcelona is committed to making data open. This is of course a key future asset, the richness of data. And then who owns the enterprises in the city? Is it multinational corporations or is it locally owned businesses? Atlanta has five times more black owned businesses than many of its surrounding cities because it's had a very intentional policy of supporting those entrepreneurs and enabling their ownership of enterprise, which creates wealth. So I love this question in your city or place, who owns the sources of wealth creation? This will have a huge impact on whether your city is divisive, driving value and opportunity into the hands of a few or distributive, sharing it far more equitably with all. And let's look last, of course, at finance sitting at the bottom because it's most powerful. Can your city use its annual budgeting process to create a well-being budget? Can your city use its power of procurement to purchase locally, just as Preston is doing? Can your city use its pension, the savings that it must hold for its employees to divest from fossil fuels and to invest in the future that it wants to bring about? So these are the five design traits and I hope as I talk them through you can imagine so many other ways that a city or a place could pursue its purpose, networks, governance, ownership and finance to pursue thriving. So let's put them here. Now imagine you were in this conversation. Which of these design traits still draws our place back to that extractive economy that's degenerative and divisive? Do we have an old purpose? Is it our governance? Is it how we're owned? Is it finance? and which already enables us to pivot forward because there will already be some design traits that are allowing you to move to that future. Now let's recognize that cities are embedded in very, very much wider complex systems of governance. So let's look at the city. What can the city do on these five traits? What's at the level of the province or the nation? I created this originally for cities in Europe. So what's at the level of the European Union? What's at the level of the international community? You could change the labels here, it could say, community, town, city, province. So you can recognize, you can change the labels according to what's the most relevant set. I saw somebody writing in the chat earlier, um, a suggestion of having a, like a Russian dolls of the donuts, which is a beautiful idea, but you also have Russian dolls of authority and power to act. And so let's recognize them all. Now, if you were in a workshop, this becomes a canvas, put on the canvas post-it notes of all the ways that different authorities pull us back and all of the ways that they enable us to pivot forward. And then we can ask, what can the city stop doing now? Because it's within our power. And what can the city start doing now? Because it's within our power. And what can we only do 
if we get together with other cities, other nations, or the international community to change longer, deeper trends. Again, other people have raised in the conversation today, how do you face vested interests? And to me, this is one of the ways, building that critical mass, building that momentum of proof of concept in place to place to place, it begins to inspire nations that see the innovations in their cities. And it begins, of course, to build that critical momentum to make change happen. I'm gonna stop there. If anybody has questions that you want to bring around this, um, Andrew can pose some of them to me. Any ideas or suggestions or reflections on what I've just shared about the powers to act? Great, thank you. I'm seeing a few questions. I see one from Adam Lerner who uh, has a question about, if we agree collectively as a city that we need more commons spaces, then how do we create the ownership model for those commonly held assets? And has anyone experimented with cooperative ownership models? in cities that are engaging with the donor? Fantastic question. And I'm not an expert on that. And I bet there are some cool people on this call who've done it, but let's think about um, communally owned space. How do you reclaim spaces? I showed, I think it was last week, I showed those cars parked in a, on a patch in Bogota and the city said, why are we giving this away to cars? Let's reclaim this as a park for people and turned it into a pocket park in the middle of the city. To me, that's a great example of a local commons that the community around massively value and will steward and care for. You can also, and cities like Detroit have done amazing work of seeing derelict blocks and saying, let's turn this into an urban farm. And they've now called it, an, uh, the neighborhood has become an agrihood. They grow food on the urban farm. Some of that food is then given in boxes to very low income families in the neighborhood. So you can already see the ways it's touching on so many points of the social, of, of the portrait of the city. So reclaiming that land, but also thinking about, you know, what do you do in a, in a city like so many where housing is privately owned, where the government have sold off social housing. And of course, we're seeing the rise of community land trusts, community owned housing, people beginning to try to assert and what is it the state can do in those cities to enable them? So they don't only have to compete with market prices, but actually can the state step in and support and help make communally owned housing, communally owned new park spaces, many, many things. And I think it's a beautiful question. How do we re-emerge and make space for the commons in places that have been so heavily privatized? I bet loads of people have got, if you've got examples on this, please put them in the chat because I know Adam and everybody will appreciate them. I'm definitely seeing examples of uh, other initiatives. Community land trusts came up. There's, there's others. I wanted to bring another question this time from Martha Brady asking about how do we tap into behavioral economics and, and nudges idea in the right direction? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, that's, that's really powerful. So the idea of nudge is that you can design something into the environment that you're not changing the financial incentives that people face, but you're doing something that makes them choose to go this way rather than that way. A, a, a common example would be um, in supermarkets actually, some supermarkets realize, well, we all know where supermarkets line the checkout till with sweets, sweets and sugar and sugar at the height of a five-year-old. And so that's a very strong nudge to make that five-year-old nag their mother or father to buy them sweets. And so removing that or putting in a school canteen, putting healthy food first rather than chips first. So that's a nudge. And in cities, it's there's some great experiments that have, have shown if you, if you, for example, in people coming out of a subway, if there's a flight of steps and there's an escalator, if you put green arrows on the steps, people actually follow those arrows. They're like, oh yeah, why not? So that lighthearted nudge, and I would say that the, the clowns in Bogota were a nudge. They're not stopping people from breaking the traffic rules, but by laughing at them or giving them a red card, it's a nudge with humor towards better behavior. So there are many, many great examples that yes, you can use um, and I would say that's under governance, it's a, it's a sort of soft form of governance, and I think it's actually a hugely underexplored area of how we best nudge ourselves, encourage ourselves to bring out the best side of ourselves in the way we live together in our cities. Let's take one more, because then we're going to wrap up. All right, one more, and it's, uh, it's a great one, actually. Uh, I don't think there's a correct answer, but how do, you, how do we do this work in the context of conflict or crises? Mm. Or is peace a prerequisite? Uh, is the question from Eva Olumi. Eva, that is a very profound question. And I often think with great questions, the person asking it 
probably has the best idea to a really smart answer to it. Is peace a prerequisite for doing this work? I think having structures of governance, well, let me start by saying, I'm gonna start by assuming, yes, structures of governance that enable people to have a water to supply, to have housing, to have mobility. This feels like a prerequisite, but actually earlier this week, Andrew and I, were invited to have a conversation with the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, UN OCHA. They were saying, well, we're working in refugee camps, we're working in situations of fragility and conflict, and we're just looking at the donut and asking ourselves, could this be a useful tool for us? Our principle is we never, we never push anything, so we weren't trying to say, yes, 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 it is a useful tool. We were saying, here's the tool, let us explain it. You are the best judges of whether this is useful because we know that even in, conf in situations of conflict, people find ingenious ways of meeting their needs for food and housing and shelter. People set up markets on the spot, people create new communities. So you could actually map all of those things, all of those activities going on, they're happening because humanity is innovative and, and needs to meet its needs. So we don't yet know that, but ever it's a really interesting question of if and how and when it could be a useful tool and then for how it would need to be adapted to make it super useful to that context because the usefulness must always come first. Okay, so great, great questions. I'm going to share my screen for the last time because I want to wrap up with some resources that we want to share with you. So let's pull out. What we've done this week is explore two ways of downscaling the donor. Andrew introduced that international downscaling using internationally comparable data sets and you get these wonderful, red, well, wonderful, shocking, red overshoots of those national donuts. They make sense when you compare them across countries. And then we feel it, they, they, they don't make enough sense to us the closer and closer we get. And so what we then want to do is look at the downscaling with the four lens approach within a place using the full sensing and knowledge of that place, the full access to data, the full stories of the people of that place, their own aspirations. And then we did the four lens that I introduced in the global north. Andrew shared what's already happening in places in the global south. We will be publishing that later. Um, we then went into breakout groups and you've come back with amazing examples and then I shared these ideas on the powers to act. So let me just finish by sharing some resources that are already available. Some inspirations out of today's session. If you want the latest that's already been made available by Donut Economics Action Lab of tools for downscaling the donut, go on our platform and go to this tool on the left, the introductory guide to dead down scaling the donut. Every time we come up with a new tool, we'll be adding it there. So that's always gonna be a reliable place to go for all the tools available. The ones that we've been showing today, like the four lenses of the, of the canvas and the powers to act, we haven't published them yet. So they are to come. The Global South methodology is to come. It will all be shared here. In the middle is a story. Many people were inspired, I think, to start creating a group and so here's a story, and I now know Kate Goodwin is in this group today. So Kate, thank you for writing the story. It's a beautiful example of how inspiring stories are to others. So Kate wrote this story about five cities that were starting through a community-led effort, through community-based coalitions to start doing this. How do we start a coalition and a network in this place? It will give you such inspiration because of course it's happened in different ways everywhere. So you might recognize your own situation in there. And then I'm also sharing this uh, new report from Melbourne, from Towards a Regenerative Melbourne, because of all places that I've seen do it so far, they were particularly focused on doing a really participatory, listening, community, workshop-led process of saying, what does it mean to thrive in Melbourne, with beautiful graphics and illustrations. So if you think, I want to bring that participatory spirit into what we do, go and look at what they did. I think it's really inspiring. Another tool that I think could be really useful to everybody is a tool we created called the Dimensions of the Donut. So just the Global Donut has 12 social foundations and nine planetary boundaries. And of course, some of these concepts are familiar and some of them are not so familiar. So we created a tool that has slide by slide, one slide for each of them all. So here you can see on the left or at the top, you can see food and political voice. They come from the social foundation. And then there's a slide on climate change and on nitrogen and phosphorus loading. You might think, what is nitrogen and phosphorus loading? This is what it is. It explains it in clear, simple terms. So that if you want to share these ideas with anybody else, it's all here. And as Deal, we know our next step is to do this for now the four lenses of the portrait so that there's also related 
detail of what it means. So everyone's, oh, you're talking about that. I understand that. Now I feel empowered to be in this conversation. There's also donut diagrams, these three diagrams available in over 25 languages. And if you are motivated to contribute your language, if it's missing, there are also instructions for how you can use some open source software that's there and contribute more. So we want to make these concepts and tools available in as many languages as possible. Andrew shared this work on downscaling the donut at the beginning of this session. And this is, of course, humanity's challenge to transform the direction that we're moving in. I shared how can we scale down at the level of the city? And these are the canvases. These are yet to come. Andrew, do you just want to say one more time about the Global South methodology and when we should expect to see that coming? Yeah, sure. We are hoping to have that uh, basically a public consultation that we're hoping to announce by the end of, of the month of July where we'll be hosting a public webinar, and then we will be inviting contributions for an extended period of time online, of course, to, to, for people to comment and input their thoughts and ideas and, and questions. Great. So next week, we're gathering again. So we've just done when, when the donut meets the city. Next week, we're going to do, can we do business in the donut? I know I saw many people raising this question we will be taking that on. And as you can already see, that signboard is there. So if you want to get thinking in advance, think about the design of business, its purpose, networks, governance, ownership, and finance, because of course this determines everything about whether business helps bring us into the donut or drives us out of it. And we will be meeting in week four, those people from Civic Square in Birmingham, from Brussels and Curaçao. So I'm so looking forward to the next session. I'm going to stop sharing here and hand back to Jim to close today's session. Thanks so much for amazing, amazing contributions in the chat boxes and in the Google slides. It's, it's a real joy doing this. It Thank really you. is. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, brilliant as usual, you inspire us. And Andrew, your command of detail is absolutely amazing. I understand watching the two of you operate while you're uh, tweedly D and tweedly dumb on donut economics. <laughs> it's uh, it's an amazing uh, experience just to watch the synergy uh, between the two of you. Um, I'd like to to close um, uh, with a comment uh, coming, uh, Kate and Andrew, out of the last question. I, I think it's a it was a profound question, and I'd like to just underscore that. Given world circumstances, we can't wait for peaceful conditions. We have to create them uh, because the chaos is escalating all around us, as we all know. And our leaders are either unwilling or incapable of taking the necessary actions to create the conditions uh, for the kind of peace we all know is possible. And so, as Gandhi so famously said, we have to be uh, what we're looking for, so that if we're looking for peace, um, we're looking for change, we're looking for love, uh, we're looking for donut economics, we have to just do it and realize, as Kate has, as Andrew has, as so many of you have, that if you want donut economics, you have to create it that it is something that uh, it's a vision that calls us to um, act and embody um, that which we seek to see in the world. And so I just wanted to uh, say that uh, by way of thanking Kate, you and Andrew and the others in the, the donut economics team that have so valiantly uh, been bringing this into the world we at Ubiquity University, uh, I had a vision of a whole new kind of learning. And, and with colleagues have been bringing Ubiquity University and, and, the, and out of that has come the masters in regenerative uh, action because we had not only a vision, but we realized that we had to be the proximate causation of anything that we wanted to see into the world. And so I would just, um, put that out there for everyone's uh, collective um, uh, reflection. 
Um, and then also say something uh, as we close about the nature of this program. You know, most of the educational systems that all of us have been a part of, particularly in Europe and, and Asia and Latin America, every course is prescribed by the government. Education is one of the most closely guarded and secured aspects of human society. Why? Because that's what shapes the consciousness of the emerging generation. So in France, for example, everybody takes the same course at the same time every day. But ubiquity, we do it very differently. We believe that one of the key aspects of the emerging global civilization has to be autonomy. So in our Masters in Regenerative Action, you'll see some core courses like Kate's course. And then Ed Muller is doing something on a survey of regeneration uh, uh, and there'll be others. But for the most part, you're free to take the kind of courses that you need in your situation from not only what Ubiquity is offering, but from what other of our partners are providing. Um, so we try to custom design with each student the pathway that you need um, to take in terms of your learning to empower you to take the actions required to have an impact in a regenerative way. And the whole purpose of this MRA is on social impact. And you've seen whether it's Amsterdam or Melbourne or, or all the other examples that Kate and, and Andrew put forward today uh, from the cities. Uh, each city and each individual will, will develop regenerative activities and donut economics in their own specific way. So when you enter into the, the, our MRA, don't assume that you're going to be told what to do every step along the way. We're getting launched with Kate and Ed and a few other courses to set the foundation of this program. But then we want to really nuance it along a pathway that each and every one of you students all, I got the final number 343 as of today, um, and scores of people that are joining the, the master's program. Um, and we want to custom design. And in fact, we're going to have an open house in a couple of weeks uh, where Leslie, Ed, and a few others are going to just talk about the innovative nature of our master's program. So that's it uh, for today, everyone. Kate, Andrew, thank you so much. Uh, everyone, uh, it's been inspiring to, to hear all of your ideas. And we'll see you next week, same time, same station, uh, for lecture number three uh, by Kate uh, uh, Rayworth. Bye for now. Bye. Thanks thank so you, much, Kate. Ed. Thank you, Andrew. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone.